Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. I wasn't at Unpacked for personal reasons, but I was in the know and Samsung shipped me a Galaxy S10 Plus device to look at. Samsung released an overwhelming amount of devices the other day, which is great because there's a device for everyone. So I spent a good bit of time composing together a summary that explains all the new features while testing out a few, confirms the old but great features that stuck around, and points out what's interesting about each of the four models released at Unpacked. So let's get into it. So for all the new features for the S10 family, we first have Android Pie with simplified One UI, which I am quite liking, especially the official dark mode, and the full screen gestures in place of the navigation bar. We have the Infinity O Dynamic AMOLED displays that support HDR10+. This is across all the phones. So this is an AMOLED screen that has two color profiles. They simplified it to sRGB and DCI-P3. I will get into the accuracy of these profiles in the full review, but don't be fooled into thinking the Vivid Mode's full color volume will make everything look accurate. There is still no color management, and you need to select the right profile for the content you are viewing. Most everything is encoded for sRGB, so the Vivid P3 mode will just oversaturate content not meant for it. It's got peak luminance of 1200 nits, but typical max brightness of 700 nits, and a fantastic contrast ratio, since this is OLED. But the big thing here is the dynamic tone mapping. So Samsung says about HDR10+, it optimizes colors from scene to scene and produces better contrast between dark and light scenes within HDR source content. So content that supports HDR10+, like from Amazon, should look awesome on these displays. We shall see. We've got even less bezel now on these screens. They look like they are all display. And this looks gorgeous. The camera hole doesn't bother me as it's less noticeable than a notch, especially the single front camera versions. And when watching 69 content, the active screen area doesn't reach the cameras. These displays produce 42% less blue light without a filter. So less harmful blue light is better for our eyes and helps to not mess with our circadian rhythm, especially when looking at your phone at night. We've got an all-new in-screen ultrasonic fingerprint sensor on all but the S10e. Now, in looking at this, I realized that there's no iris scanner anymore. I'm actually quite happy about that. So now we just have the fingerprint and face for biometric unlocking. And I really like this ultrasonic fingerprint sensor because it provides a simple, unified way of unlocking the phone, no matter how you're holding it or where it's sitting. It's much less fidgety than solutions of the past. And by the way, they got rid of the pressure sensor home button, but the new full screen gestures take its place perfectly. I'm still a bit sad though. All remnants of a physical home button are gone. Now jumping to performance, we have the Snapdragon 855 SoC with 29% faster CPU and 37% faster GPU than the S9. There is a vapor chamber cooling system, and that's only available on the Galaxy S10 Plus, but the S10 and the S10e have an advanced heat pipe cooling system instead. Then we've got AI-powered performance enhancement called Intelligent Performance, which optimizes the battery, CPU, RAM, and even device temperature based on how you use your phone, and it's going to continue to learn and get better over time. Now bouncing to the cameras. So we've got two front-facing cameras in some configurations. We've got a main 10 megapixel dual pixel f1.9 aperture autofocus camera. And then there's a second one that's just for depth info. But what's really awesome is that the front camera is capable of capturing UHD video now. I rarely use the front camera and now I might. But watch out, there is no optical image stabilization on this camera, so pictures can look blurry and video shaky. Enable video stabilization, EIS that is, in settings. Then on the back, we have a mess of cameras. So what's all new is that we have a 123 degree ultra wide angle camera, and this is on all the models. So with this ultra wide angle camera, you can take wide family photos and also some really impressive looking panoramas. Panoramas are only made with the ultra wide angle camera. And I noticed that good lighting is imperative. Indoor panoramas have too much noise reduction, but they look great outdoors. And then in addition to the ultra wide camera, on all the models we get the dual aperture main camera, 
And then in some configurations, we get the telephoto camera. I'm personally really happy that they chose to put the ultra wide angle camera on all the models instead of the telephoto one. I don't use live focus too often. Then we've also got an NPU, which stands for Neural Processing Unit for the cameras. So they say that the scene optimizer can now recognize and more accurately process more scenes, which is up to 30. Within these new scene options, we have Samsung's answer to Google's night site called Bright Night, but you need to enable it under settings for some reason. After just taking a peek at it, I think that Google's still looks better. Samsung also says that the NPU helps with shot suggestions, such as with composition and making sure that your shot is level. So they say this is a really smart camera, can't take a bad photo. We'll see. Now what's really cool is that the rear main camera can record in HDR10+, so that will be really neat to see in combination with the HDR10 Plus capable display. Keep in mind though that the HDR10 Plus footage you take will only play back correctly on screens that support HDR10 Plus. So it's going to make more sense to keep this off for footage you intend to share off the phone. We've got new electronic image stabilization processing for super stable video, and I agree that Samsung has really needed some improvement with their video stabilization. This super steady mode uses the wide angle camera, crops the video, and analyzes it for shake. The ultra wide angle camera can handle cropping the frame more for shake analysis without being too cropped. It's pretty convincing. I was full on jogging in this scene. Just make sure to be in good lighting or it will quickly look like an unstabilized mess. I can't wait to test this more. Now for all this content that you're recording, they're saying that we're going to get Premiere Rush for Galaxy smartphones so that you can edit your videos on the go. And they say it will support DeX and also your HDR10 plus footage. And that is coming later this year. So it doesn't sound like it's coming at launch. Now I am so grateful that all of these phones have great battery sizes. They're really not chintzing here. And Samsung is stating that the S10 Plus lasts 25% longer than the S9 Plus, and this is partly due to more efficient power management. Another cool feature is that we have power share so that you can essentially treat the phone as its own little Qi charging pad. So these phones are able to share power to other Qi supported devices with wireless charging. We've also got improved fast wireless charging 2.0, and they say that the S10 charges 36% faster than before. And they also point out that the speed increase varies by phone. We've got eight gigabyte RAM configurations for all the models and a 12 gigabyte configuration for the S10 Plus only. We've also got a one terabyte storage option for the S10 Plus only. And we have support for Wi-Fi 6, plus intelligent Wi-Fi switching from Wi-Fi to LTE and vice versa when appropriate. So that's a lot of new stuff to look at. But we've also got some oldies but goodies, and that is the IP68 water and dust resistance. We've got the headphone jack still. We've got SD card slots, except for the 5G model. For some reason that doesn't have an SD card slot. We've got stereo Dolby Atmos speakers tuned by AKG. We've got Samsung Pay with MST, which means Magnetic Secure Transmission. So if a terminal doesn't accept NFC payments, it'll still work with MST. And we've got the heart rate sensor for the Samsung Health app, although the 10e doesn't have it. So with all of these features that these phones can do, what is specifically interesting about each device? This is where I got trumped up because there's just so many. So let's try to condense it a little bit, starting with the S10e. Size-wise, it's about the size of an iPhone 10 and not as tall as the S9. It's the smallest, cheapest model, and it's flat-screened. Finally, a flat-screened model meant for those who want something more compact. And it is missing some features being an economy-level phone, such as the in-screen fingerprint sensor. It still has a fingerprint sensor, but it's mounted on the side and it's capacitive instead. The S10e doesn't have a telephoto camera, which I really don't care about. And it doesn't have the heart rate sensor, but it keeps all of the core features. So you're really not missing out on much by getting the 10e. Note though that it's the only 1080p display of all the devices, but it has a high PPI like the others. That will probably be my favorite model. 
Then we've got the S10, and size-wise, it's a smidge taller than the S9 with a bigger 6.1-inch display. It was 5.8 inches on the S9, and I think that this model is the least interesting. It's just a smaller version of the S10 Plus, but it might be nice if you don't want a phone that's as big as the S10 Plus, so it's a good balance of size and features. It has all the new features, including the three back cameras, but excludes the second front-facing camera. That camera provides depth only, though, so it's just for live focus. It's not too much of a loss, unless you really want that feature. And then we have the S10 Plus. Now, dimensionally, it's a smidge smaller than the S9 Plus, but it has a huge 6.4-inch display. And this is the one I think that most people are going to want. This is the one that people can totally deck out until it burns your wallet. So the S10 Plus has all the new features, plus options of a ceramic back, which comes in both black and white. You can get up to 12 gigabytes of RAM where others cap at eight gigabytes of RAM. We have a terabyte storage option where the others cap at either 512 or 256 gigabytes of storage. We've got two front cameras. We've got the main camera and the second one for depth, which is used for computing portraits, shallow depth of field. We've got that huge 6.4 inch display, which is the same size as the Galaxy Note 9s. Now, honestly, I think that the six gigabyte of RAM, 128 gigabyte of storage option will be just fine for me. The rest seems totally overkill. I would say that if you want the higher options, get it for the storage and not for the impressive RAM. 12 gigabytes is way more than the phone needs. And finally, the bonus phone, the S10 5G. Dimensionally, it's about the size of the Note 9, so it's not too crazy. Now it's got all the new features and has a massive 6.7 inch dynamic AMOLED display. And it has not just three, but four cameras on the back. So we've got the same three as the S10 Plus and an additional 3D depth camera for video live focus. So you can adjust the depth of field inside of video, not just for pictures. So that's pretty cool. I might actually care about that. And it's supposed to work with some AR features as well. It's got a huge 4,500 milliamp hour battery, 5G technology, two front cameras like the S10 Plus, but instead of the RGB depth sensor, it has a 3D depth camera. They say it charges faster with a 25 watt charger and supports power delivery 3.0. This is a phone to make people poop themselves, but caveats, there are caveats. So there's no SD card slot and no terabyte option or even 512 gigabyte storage option. So this one exclusively gets eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of fixed internal storage. And another thing is that it's released only on Verizon right now. Later this year, it should be released for other networks. And the biggest thing is it's probably prohibitively expensive. So I'm not really quite sure to think about that. So I hope that that little guide helps to see what all the new features are, old features, and what makes these devices interesting. Hopefully it can help you decide which one to pick for yourself. Do I think that Samsung did enough with the S10 update? Honestly, I think I need some time to digest to really see how this all works out. So this has been Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell to be notified of future videos. And have a good night, you guys. Bye!